Blair and colleagues, Belt, uh, thank you for the compliment and uh, thank you for the invitation and the smooth organization up till now. Welcome to you all uh, for uh, to our talk. My name is Alice Feldkamp and I'm a teacher educator biology and educational developer. And as already mentioned, I did my PhD on yes. There it is. Slightly glitched of the technology. I did my PhD on the design and implementation of educational escape rooms. And today is a sort of experiment because we are surrounded with new technology in this room. Yeah. And um, I've never done it before, so it's my first talk all around to the screens. It allows me to walk during my talk. And I see you all on a mute screen, but it is technology. So um, I have one colleague volunteering, so I will show him so that you know when I'm shouting, I'm not shouting to you. I'm shouting to Dr. Michiel van Haskamp, and I'm very uh, pleased that he volunteered today. As in the Netherlands, it is an obligatory holiday. So we are in a building empty dark corridors, a little bit creepy. Um, the part of this city is unit you know, 30 buildings, all empty. So we are already getting the escape room vibe. So let's get started. Uh, I love uh, a lot of things about escape rooms, but as an educator, I find this aspect very fascinating. In my opinion, escape rooms is a unique phenomenon in educational history. Why? Because teachers all around the world, from in primary, secondary, higher education, professional development, all adapted the concept of escape rooms spontaneously. And with spontaneously, I mean not instigated by national curricula, pedagogical centra, school boards, etc. And the concept of escape rooms even survived the corona lockdown, boosting the design and research of digital escape rooms. So I think it's a very unique concept, and it's a very unique that uh, Claire and colleagues uh, fostered the community all around the world to develop knowledge on this. Yeah. If you know another educational intervention with such a bottom-up implementation in education, please put it in the chat. Please put it in the chat. But I think it's very unique. Okay, so uh, my presentation is on three points. One, the three main challenges for escape rooms in education. Yeah, we uh, encountered during our own development. Another aspect is the search for an adequate framework addressing precisely those three challenges. And then, as today's showcase, I'll ex explain and critically evaluate the use of that framework uh, when we developed an escape game with it and research how students learn during the gameplay. And to be more precise, which game design elements foster learning during gameplay and which hinder? Yeah, so this is an overview of my talk. But as a teacher, you always want to address to a target group. So who are you? That organization already uh, gave us this nice infographic, and you can see we are a very diverse public, very diverse audience. Now, for the rest of my talk, I need to know two things. One, what is your experience in designing escape rooms? Yeah. And what do you use? So we change to booklet with the help of Michiel. Yes. So you can, with your mobile, scan the QR code or go to Google.com and enter this code. 
Yeah, and we also uh, put the link in the chat, thanks to Michiel. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Okay, not so. Uh, yes, it's coming. It's nice to see. Let's wait till we have more votes. Okay. I can't respond to all the messages now, but I hope uh, Claire will uh, monitor the, the chat. Okay, so we see that we have uh, a lot of people in the audience uh, with not that much experience. So when I use concept you're not known, you don't know, then put it in the chat then uh, Claire will monitor and explain. Yeah. And we uh, have some people designing other games, recreational, wow, professional designers, and uh, the rest, one third, is developing educational uh, escape rooms. So we have quite a diverse public also in this. So let's see, what do you use when you develop games? So the question is, what do you use for designing or assessing critically your escape room or escape game? Please name your model, stepping plan, your theory, or do you use intuition, experience, creativity? And you're allowed to type in more than one, more than one uh, answer. Okay. Well, it's quite dynamic uh, layout. You see, the main word is clearly creative creativity, intuition, and experience. And I think, like that was with me, that you have experience as a teacher and experience playing recreational escape rooms. Okay, so this is an aspect interesting to look at. It switches all the time. I'm not fast enough, guys. Sorry. Okay, so um, this is one is an interesting university feel level. We'll see that later. And I see a lot of terms coming back. Oh, yeah, room to educate. Yeah, that's a famous one. A lot of case studies. Okay, so. Most of it creativity and experience and some step-by-step uh, -step guides. Okay, so let's switch to the presentation. Yeah. So um, after life unit experience of uh, developing escape rooms based on my creativity experience and with the group and with the students, we came up and we distinguished three main challenges we wanted to tackle. And the, ma the main challenges for de developing escape rooms in education are one is to align the educational design with the game design. And when we looked at it, it's a common challenge and difficulty written about in serious game literature. And the research on it in the serious game literature says uh, that when you put too much of the balance on educational design, students don't recognize it as a game or think it's not immersive, it's boring, etc. And uh, research on it also shows that when there's a put, there's put a lot of effort on the game design, yeah, they have a lot of fun, it's playful, but then teachers wonder what are the learning outcomes and wonder if it's time efficient enough to spend so much time on a game having the learning goals. So apparently it's very difficult to balance those aspects. And uh, well, we'd like to know if there is a framework 
which even intertwine those designs. Another challenge we encountered was to transit students from the real world, a classroom with benches, not very immersive context, and then uh, uh, transit it to the game world. So how did I step into the magic circle? Because yeah. sometimes the, the game world was a submarine or another planet. Well, you don't step from your class bench into the planet Mars, something like that. So how can we foster this step? And then the last challenge we encountered was how to transform developmental knowledge and skills of the students into a back to the real world in another context. So how to decontextualize the game topic, the knowledge in the game to back to the classroom assignments or even better, the real world. Yeah, how to foster that. Okay, so we uh, conducted a systematic review. It was uh, escape education, and we focused on uh, summer practices and theoretical considerations regarding educational aspects and game aspects. And uh, we looked at, for educational aspects, we looked at what are target groups in all those researches, uh, what were uh, learning goals, the teacher role, or the position of the escape room within the learning trajectory. So did uh, researchers put it at the start of an escape, of a learning trajectory, or as a formative assessment in the middle, or as summative assessment as at the end, like the previous uh, lecturer talked about. And um, the game aspects we looked at, so what do puzzles look like? What's their structure? What's appropriate team size, playtime, etc. So then we wanted to know if and how these aspects are related. And what extent have attended goals, the learning goals being achieved. So uh, it yielded very practical information on all these aspects. So please take a look at it. But for today, we focus on the theoretical considerations and how these aspects are related. Yeah. OK. So to wrap that up, I would like to compare the structure of an article with the structure of this juicy burger. Fashion burger, of course, nowadays. Yeah. And so for me, the main part of the burger and the main part of the article is the escape room design a description. I love to read how you designed the puzzles or the puzzle organization and all that sort of things. But we also like to know what directed the decision in relation to the escape room elements. Yeah. So we searched for it and we found only a few considerations in only a few articles. And they were not theoretically induced. So, uh, for example, the choice of the puzzle path was uh, motivated. And uh, especially when I choose uh, other puzzle paths than a linear, I said, uh, author said, well, we do that to create social independence. So when you offer more puzzles at the same time, they need to uh, teamwork and it creates uh, social independence. Yeah. Other considerations were on the classroom's dynamic in questions whether uh, not or uh, whether the uh, teacher should be in the room or out of the room, whether or not to grade their performances. So all classroom and motivational considerations. Now, but a good article always has an introduction with a nice literature, uh, theoretical background. So let's look what yields that. So in all those 40 articles and researchers, researchers uh, we found uh, seeds of one game theory, and it was the flow theory, yeah, saying that uh, participants, players, 
need to have flow to make it to the end. So flow is important. But it wasn't described how you can create flow. One other step-by-step uh, -step guide, which was mentioned, was Escape X. And I'll give the reference in a minute. Yeah. But uh, the rest of the theoretical background was filled with layers of educational theories. Theories like social constructivism, behaviorism, very big theories, or problem-based theories, team-based theories, um, was it? Yeah, collaborative learning and active learning. Those were the theories mentioned. But it was a pity that it wasn't explained how these theories directed the design choices. And that was what we are looking for. Yeah? So we have a lot of experiment, experience, but how do, do it, does this work? So we saw isolated layers of theory, isolated layer of nice escape rooms, but no directions we could use. But maybe in conclusion or the discussion. So let's see. Okay, the results were always uh, very often crispy and positive, and that was why we stimulate and we like to do escape rooms or not. So when we look at the discussion and conclusion, unfortunately, we didn't see critical reflection on the models of the theories mentioned in the introduction. And uh, to be honest, in one article, we were guilty of that too. So apparently, due to word count limits, I don't know, but we didn't do it. And I think it's necessary to develop our knowledge base as a community. Yeah, so a lot of experiences but what does really work? We need to know that's a uh, research base. Okay, so yeah, this was the uh, guide, uh, the step-by-step -step guide, which was mentioned. And at the time, there was another uh, nice step-by-step uh, -step guide by Guignon, but it wasn't used in the studies we researched. So that's not much. But now you can say, Alice, that was four years ago. We have continued. So come on, what's the problem? Well, in those four years, we have very rich step-by-step -step, uh, guides, or some are uh, circular, iterative, and they are very nice and rich in uh, guidelines how to develop. Yeah? For example, uh, there's even an EU project with a lot of handbooks on escape rooms. This one is number two, designing education escape rooms, but it's more. So, um, well, that's good. However, if we look to the challenges we had, the challenges, the challenge number three was how to transfer knowledge. Now, luckily, half of them addresses that uh, issue and uh, uh, asked for attention for uh, debriefing. So that's a plenary reflection afterwards. So a lot of them address uh, challenge number three, but as we can see in this uh, nice article with the intriguing title, when design gets in the way, yeah, one of the conclusions is that there is a need for a clear design that integrates puzzles subject context and game elements. So we're still with the challenge how to align educational and game design. Yeah, so uh, we started to look in a series game theories and we found this model made by uh, Anna van der Linde and colleagues and I tested it on a uh, serious game on Newton's rule. And it looks very straightforward yeah, with four squares and uh, align arrows aligning it, and let's and we used it to uh, look if we can use it with the data on the systematic review. So it says the game goal and the learning goal should be aligned. Well, that's obvious, 
And in the escape rooms we studied, we saw that medical escape rooms, uh, they were very well aligned. Because in medical escape rooms, the goal is always rescue the patient, rescue someone else. And the learning goals are about uh, setting the right diagnose, choose the right antidote, calculate the right antidote, and variations of it. So, a very good alignment. Maybe ask, can this go wrong? Yes, it can. We saw in uh, escape rooms with, for example, learning goals on mathematics, that the goal was to open the drawer of the professor to find a document with their grades. Or in other escape room, the goal was to open the box with all the mobile phones of the students. Yeah, it's a nice goal. It's a nice goal. The teacher locked it up. But as I can see on your faces, you already understand what happens. Students go direct to the game goal, yeah, without doing any calculations or assignments to reach. Uh, the game goal. So it's important also, it sounds very obvious, it's important to align this. Now, when you've set the learning goals, it should be funded by a pedagogical approach. So in the case of this uh, research, it was on uh, Newton laws, and that shows a pedagogical approach precisely addressing those goals. In escape rooms, I already mentioned all of the pedagogical approach mentioned, and as an example, I'll, shoot, uh, I'll choose team-based learning. As in medical escape rooms, this was the pedagogical approach most chosen, team-based learning. Okay, now, then we need to address the game mechanics supporting the pedagogical approach. And in one third of the medical escape rooms we examined in this study, yeah, we saw that students were complaining that they were not all activated or that one person could solve the puzzle on his own. And in all those escape games, we looked at the game mechanics used. And then we saw that indeed they used a, a, a linear, as we already saw in the previous lecture, a linear structure in puzzles, but the puzzles could be solved by one person. Or we saw that the group number was six to eight person. And then with six or eight person doing one puzzle, well, you can imagine that you don't support the team-based learning. Yeah. So although it makes sense, it's good to lay this, overlay this on your design to see if it's really aligned. Yeah. This this line, game mechanics supporting the game goal, we read a lot about it in all the research because a lot of uh, research say, well, you have to play test to see if this works. So with a lot of play testing, you see you can align this. So to wrap up, we find a nice framework uh, focusing on the alignment. But that leaves us two other challenges, yeah? And uh, we found in the framework of fish and colleagues precisely a framework depicting these two uh, challenges. So their framework says, well, you want to have the player in the real world and at some point a transition to the game world and at some point you want to play a back in the real world. Yeah. Game concepts supporting that, and it's very famous concepts very crucial concept in game theory is immersion. So if you can create immersion, it helps uh, students or players to finish it. Yeah. Okay, and the concept used uh, supporting transfer is called debriefing. In education setting, we would say a plenary discussion afterwards, but in game theory firms, it's called debriefing. Okay, so a nice framework addressing these two challenges, and we have already another. So now we have a framework addressing all three challenges. Now, and now I come to the last part of my talk, 
to showcase how we uh, used it. How many minutes do I have left, Michiel? 14. 14. Okay. You're still with me? Yes, I see them. So some of you are still alive. Yeah. Okay. So a framework and uh, yeah, oh, we wrote about it uh, because we uh, critically evaluated before using it for a new escape room. Okay, we had the assignment to develop an escape room on the A-levels uh, curricula uh, for immunology. Yeah, so it was an assignment we got. Okay, so to foster the transition with immersion, we had to look for things that uh, scaffold the immersion. In a recreational escape room, you often have a pre-room, a sort of waiting room already in the atmosphere of the uh, escape room coming, explaining in a playful way the rules, and sometimes there are already some puzzles to get the uh, players in the mood. Yeah, But uh, we on the university can't do that, and in secondary education, you don't have rooms for that for a playroom. So we had to come up with someone, uh, something else. And based on the literature in serious games, we uh, gave students in a team a different role in the story. So each a different role. So one was the farmer, the other one was the vet, or the physician, or the governmental uh, representative, or the civilian. Yeah, and we gave them accompanying clothes, or at least one prop. We used authentic footage from the real world, from a news channel, to bring the real world into the game world. We used the sound design, because it was set uh, to be creating an immersive atmosphere, and maybe forget the other players or other students in the room, so we designed the same design. And last thing was escape boxes. And I need to explain what an escape box looks like. So in the room, there are uh, everywhere boxes with students around it. Yeah. So these boxes show the screen with the narrative or the footage. They yeah, showed the puzzles and I had hatches with locks. So during the story, the hatches unfolds and the story unfolds. So these boxes were developed, mind you, by uh, pupils and students. And we wrote about it in another article. Um, it's very nice uh, to read. And the boxes have a uh, convertible fronts. So every time you as a teacher make a new uh, another uh, game on our story, you can change them. Yeah. Anyway, this was the setting for this uh, escape room. And you see the pupils in their roles of farmer, uh, governmental representative, vet, etc. OK, so this was the immersion. Now, thank you. So now for the learning goals. So the learning goals were curriculum goals on immunology and the multidisciplinary approach of zoonosis. Yeah. So uh, to align it with the game goal, we said, well, we, uh, the, the students had to defeat the Q fever, which was a uh, zoonosis epidemic in the Netherlands in the 90s. And I had to do it in a multidisciplinary team. So that was the goal. And we hoped that it was aligned enough. Now, as a pedagogical, so as a pedagogical approach, we choose collaborative learning because in all the articles it was said that was that was uh, very important and most mentioned. Now, to support collaborative learning, you have to design a game a mechanics on collaboration. So um, now it's the escape room. So the time, the game mechanic, time restriction in itself 
is again organic, uh, forcing uh, students to divide tasks. Now, we have seen that the team side of four to five is appropriate in all the research, and we use the puzzle organization offering different uh, puzzles at the same time. And we create a try to create puzzles which can't be solved by one person or one team. So one puzzle had uh, two subs, sub uh, parts, and of course the student didn't know at uh, at forehand, and I had to combine it. Another aspect, and we uh, found it in the literature on collaborative learning, and I call it resource and information dependence, meaning that in a team, different persons have access to different information. So the feds have different information in their uh, lab codes than the governmental uh, the governmental representative in his suitcase. Yeah. So different uh, information and sources. So that I had to combine and work together. Okay. This was on the uh, collaborative learning, and then the debriefing. There were two uh, research studies on the debriefing in an escape room, which element, which element it should be, uh, should be contained. And I uh, come up with the same elements. So that was nice and we used it to uh, design debriefing. Okay, so this was uh, an uh, example of how the framework focused us in designing and making some uh, design decisions. Yeah. Okay, so wrap up. This was the research question, the learning goals, and we used a mixed method containing pre and post tests, questionnaires, classroom observations, and the, the classroom <laughs> observations. Uh, we uh, yeah, looked at one team and the behavior of every member was noted every minute. There's a lot of data on the team's uh, members. And then we did the usual thing, structured interviews with students or teachers, you know. Okay, now a lot of results, but I'm only focusing on the ones where the topic is about uh, the framework and use of the framework. So we did a Spearman rank correlation and we saw a positive correlation uh, between the degree of immersion of students and the knowledge increase. So this means that the more a student was immersed, the more their knowledge increased in the post test. Yeah. Okay, so that sounds reasonable uh, logic. If you are a nurse and you do the puzzles, well, you learn very well. Okay, so what contributed most to the immersion or what contributed to this immersion? All aspects we mentioned, except for the sound design. The sound design had a very diverse reaction. Some uh, students were really frustrated, annoyed, getting stressed, unnerved by their sounds. Others said, I haven't heard anything. What sound just, uh, design do you mean? And some said, well, of course, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, added to the experience. What was the uh, element contributing most? And that was surprisingly the escape boxes. And in the interviews, uh, students and the observation of the teachers and in the interviews with the teachers, we saw that um, the students said, well, we were focused on each other and on the task. And as you can see, they used it as a table. So they used the box to put uh, the puzzles on so that everyone could have a good look. And they were so focused standing around the box, like uh, Liz already said, uh, throw the chairs out of the room, because when they are standing, they were becoming more active. Yeah, and we saw that too. 
So they're from God, they're surrounding. And each box, uh, uh, a team could finish on their own. And usually in SK box, when one group's finished, the whole uh, class stops because one group has one. And well, the learning stops too. So with the boxes, we saw that all the other teams still continued. They didn't hear, hadn't heard it. So that was a very nice result. Anyway, what surprised me most is that I, as a teacher educator, haven't put my bet on immersion. Teacher educator. So I have put my money on, of course, the fabulous dream briefing or collaborative learning. Everyone told us that it was working. So what about that? Now, we saw in relation to collaborative learning that students experienced a very high degree of collaboration. So all the elements worked in different structure to collaboration. But students felt less uh, collaborative of uh, learning collaboratively. This is neutral. Yeah, it's neutral. So when we looked closely to the classroom observations, we saw that only 3.1% of the time was spending on discussing the content of the puzzles or reflecting the subject matter. There was 70% that were busy with the games or with the content in the puzzles, but only 3.1% was explaining to each other the content or uh, why it worked, etc. So, and we saw that also in the student uh, interviews and teachers, and one teacher set a very nice an escape room direction forward, not reflecting backwards due to the time restriction. So we saw that the time restriction is at odds with the time to explain and reflect on content. And this precisely is the crucial aspect of collaborative learning in the literature. Yeah. So to wrap up, oh yeah, so uh, sorry. So the teachers and students in the interviews named that the debriefing was very appreciated, needed, etc. But the weird thing was that uh, we didn't see a correlation between the degree of debriefing and the degree of knowledge increase. And that was that because all students said a debriefing is needed. But not all students profited from the debriefing. Yeah? Okay, so to wrap up, we use this framework to help us focus on the coherent design and research various design elements related to the educational escape room challenges. From all those design elements, immersion correlates with the knowledge increase. Time restriction seemed to hinder collaborative learning during the gameplay. Although some students said that collaborative learning took place during the debriefing. Okay, so students appreciate the debriefing and in order to teachers, debriefing is crucial for the learning. But when we combine this, we come to the conclusion that only immersive escape games can help knowledge degree. So immersive escape games is essential for an effective debrief. And I think that's a nice conclusion and a start for the discussion.